Are you alive this morning? Ephesians says we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. But we've been made alive because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross when he gave his body and his blood. And we're going to celebrate communion together right now. Those who are serving, if you'd come and assume your positions. But as we look at communion, it's a time of celebration, thanking God for what he's done. But the Apostle Paul said it's also a time for examination. He said, don't eat and drink unworthily. Examine your lives. And there's really two areas that we need to examine. And the elements kind of remind us of those, what they are. Those elements are the body and the blood. And the body reminds us of our relationship with people because what did Jesus say he, when he said, this is my body, after he rose from the dead, we are now called the body of Christ. So the body, when we're partaking communion, it reminds us of our relationship with each other, both inside the faith and those outside the faith, those who are not yet Christians. We want to examine our lives to see, God, is there anything I've done that's offended someone? Anything I need to make right? Anyone that I need to go to and apologize to, we examine our relationships with people. But then we also examine our relationship with God, and the blood reminds us of that because we can now call God our Father. We were once orphans, but now we've been adopted in. we become part of the bloodline of the Father. So the body and the blood remind us of our relationship with people and our relationship with God. Is there any sin in our life that we need to confess? And so just this morning, before you partake, in a moment we're going to sing another song. We're going to ask you to come down. Our servers, they will give you the elements. And the cups are stacked. The, the bread is on the bottom. The juice is on the top, symbolizing the body and blood of Jesus. Examine yourself. And if God reminds you of anything, you need to confess. You need to get right. You need to take care of. Do that this morning. And I realize there may be some of you here, maybe you're a first-time guest, and you are with us today, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd like to give you an opportunity right now that you could get right with God. Maybe you're here and you'd say, you know, if I died right now, had a heart attack, killed over right now, I don't know if I'd go to heaven or hell. I don't know. I hope I'd go to heaven. Maybe there's some of you that say, I know I wouldn't go to heaven. I just I know what I've been doing in my life. I haven't been serving God. I haven't surrendered my life. We want to give everyone that opportunity. So would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? This is a moment between you and God. And right now, if you're here and you'd say, you know, Craig, I need to be forgiven of my sins. I haven't surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, that means he's your boss, your master, the one in charge. If you haven't surrendered your life, you're saying, I want to do that right now. Would you just slip your hand up this morning? Just put your hand up and you can put it back down. Anyone here? Thank you. I see those hands. Anyone else today? You'd say, that's me, Craig. You can just put them up and put them back down. Anyone else in the house? Maybe some of you, you're watching online. It's good to have you with us today. And God's speaking to you, to your heart. And you know that you're not right with God, that you need a relationship with him. I just want you to put your hand up in this moment. God sees you in your living room, your bedroom, family room, wherever you're watching us today. Just put your hand up at this moment. Anyone else in the house, you'd say, that's me. I need to get right with God. I want a relationship with him. Just put your hand up. You can put it back down. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to say this prayer, and I'd like everyone to repeat it together, no one praying alone. Dear Jesus, you gave your life for my sin. I know I've done wrong, and I'm separated from you. Please forgive me. I surrender my life, and I put you in charge. I want to follow you. I want to love you with all of my heart and being. Thank you for dying for me, to save me from hell, to give me eternal life with God in heaven forever. Amen. Amen. You know, there are some people today They've crossed the line and they says, hey, I want to get right with God. I want a relationship with God. And they become part of the family. They're part of that bloodline now. Can we just celebrate with heaven this morning? Amen.
Amen. We're going to sing this song, and it says, Thank you, Jesus, for the blood that was applied to my life. And as our worship team sings this, when you're ready, when you feel like you're ready to come and get the elements, you can come on down. Our servers will pass them to you, and then we will partake together after everyone has been served. Would you come this morning?
know if you've ever been in a situation where you almost lost your life singing that song where you saved my life gives it new meaning I was a kid in swimming lessons one summer and we were swimming across the pool I had to swim across and we were in water over our head and all of a sudden I cramped up and I couldn't move and I went under once and I'm flailing help help and you know how lifeguards are they never get in the water with the kids right they, you know, it's cold in those mornings they don't want it we was an outdoor pool it wasn't a nice indoor pool and uh, I go down once I come up help help I'm flailing my arms I'm looking at the lifeguard and you know he sees me he doesn't do anything I go down a second time I come up and I'm going help help and he could see the panic in my eyes and as I was starting to go down, I saw him whip off his flip-flops and he was diving in the water as I went down. And he came up and he grabbed me and he lifted me up out of the water and he saved my life. And friends, that's a picture. You maybe don't realize the drasticness of what Jesus has done for us. But we were drowning in our sins. We were dying. And he jumped in into a pool of the filth of our sin. He bore our sin and he lifted us up when he lifted his hands on the cross and he said, it is finished. And he saved us and he brought us into his family. We can celebrate this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my life. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Let's partake of the bread together. Before we do, I forgot. Pastor Zach, I want you to pray over the bread and the cup this morning. Lord, we just want to give you thanks for saving our lives right now. God, you deserve all of the honor, all of the glory. Everything right now is yours. And God, we yes, give Jesus. you our lives. Yes, God. And right now, we ask that you would bless us, God, that yes, you would God. continue to do miracles in every single person's yes, life that is here right now, God, and that you would go forth before us as a lamp showing us our next path, our next yes, steps, God. God. Continue to move in all of our lives in this yes, entire Jesus. church, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Bless us, guide us, lead us, and strengthen us, and give us all that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now let's partake of the bread. Taste that a little sweet. A little bit of honey in there. Taste and see that the Lord is good. After supper, he took the cup and said, This is my blood which is given for the forgiveness of sins. God's washed our sins away. Just as we drink this, it's going to wash the bread down. Our sins are washed away. Let's partake of the cup. Thank you, Lord. I want us to sing this chorus again. And this time, I want you to really thank him for saving your life. And as we do, our servers and ushers are going to pass through the aisles with containers for you to put your empty cups in. Let's sing that together. Jesus for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved.
was just thinking as Pastor was doing um, the communion with everyone that he laid it all down in a very brutal and horrific way for us. And yet he still gives us the choice. He didn't he didn't make it. He did I'm I did this, you you have to choose me. And he could have. But he didn't. He laid all of that down and paid for our sins and still gave us the choice. That is love. That is real love. Y'all take a minute, look around, greet somebody next to you. Just tell them Jesus loves them. Welcome to Radius Church. I'm Craig, the lead pastor, and we're so glad that you've joined us. This is our greeting time where we connect with one another, so we'll get back with you live in just a moment. We encourage you to connect with us through our website, radiuschurch.life. There you can learn more about us, the opportunities for your family, and even watch previous messages. Here at Radius, we believe that relationships matter most. First, your relationship with God, and so we want to help you center every point of your life on Jesus. Secondly, we want to help you with your relationships with people so that you can influence those relationships for Christ. If there is any way that we can help you on your spiritual journey, please give us a call at 307-265-9121 or email us at contact at radiuschurch.life. And now, let's get back to our service. Well, good morning, Radius Church. You can go ahead and turn down the music. Why don't you guys go ahead, finish your greeting, and grab a seat. Grab a seat this morning. We're going to get started with the rest of our service. It is a busy Sunday today. One, I would like to be able to say, if you don't know me, I'm Pastor Zach. I'm your student ministries and media pastor here at Radius Church. We're glad to have you guys with us today. Can you guys help me welcome all of our first-time guests this morning? Can we do that? All right, all right, yes. If you're a first-time guest, we're so glad that you're with us because we exist to help all people find and follow Jesus. That's right. That is our mission statement here, and we are dedicated to it. And so if you are a first-time guest, we have a welcome card in front of you that you can go ahead and pick up, uh, fill it out fully, Fully fill it out, please, okay? And then turn it in at the end of service over in the lobby where we have our big welcome banner. We have a welcome table. And we have a free gift for you that we'd love to get in your hands. A box has some great stuff in it. So go ahead, fill that out, turn it in at the end of service. That same card has a prayer section on it. So if you have a prayer need for you, your family, a distant uncle, aunt, something, your dog, okay? I'll pray for your dog, promise, okay? Um, Dogs are like family, okay? No, I don't have a dog, okay? Because it's, it's, it is like having a family, okay? Um, I already have two kids, okay? All right? But fill out that prayer need, okay, and then turn it in at the end of service at the drop box on your way out this morning over by the back doors. Uh, we would love to be able to pray for you guys and your guys' family needs. And then right after service, we also have our free coffees, cookies, and treats available for you guys right after service as well. A uh, couple of announcements that we have for you. One, there are two deadlines coming up. Is One is uh, Sunday, May 14th. You need to have your graduation forms filled out and turned in. I need those so that way we can honor all of our graduates that we're going to be doing on May 21st. So you have until next Sunday to get those turned in. So uh, make that happen because we would love to be able to honor and celebrate that with you guys. Uh, and then our last one is our Hot Topic Sermon Series, Summer Sermon Series that we're going to be doing this summer. And so if you have a hot topic, something that's kind of a question you've had on your mind for a very long time, but you've never really asked a question, maybe you've you know, just been kind of like, oh, I don't know. Okay, or maybe it seems like, oh, I don't know, it's a big topic. Well, we want to talk about it. We want to discuss that here in service, and so fill it out. You can go out there to the lobby, and we have free cards for you to be able to write down that, what that question is, okay? Because we want to know about it, so that way we can answer some tough questions. We're not afraid of tough questions, okay? Um, I'm trying to remember what else I have to be able to talk about. That's right! 
I've got a great new update for you guys. One, we are updating our young adults group that we have, okay? You guys have heard a little bit about our young adults group. Some of you guys are maybe new and you don't really know what exactly is young adults, okay? It's for those who are, yes, right out of high school, but we are actually, and generally, we've always gone up to the age of 30, uh, but right now, we're going to extend that age up to 35 years of age, okay? And this is a really fun group. Okay, they're really spontaneous. If you need some more spontaneity in your life, come and join the group. Okay, if you're like, I'm always inside, I don't, I don't know who to talk to, come to the group because guess what? We're going to make you talk. Okay, we're going to get you to do stuff. All right, we're going to get you to show up to bonfires afterwards and we're going we're gonna to go to movies. We're going to go out to eat and I'm not going to go to all of them because again, I got kids. Okay, so you don't have to be perfect in front of pastor every time for every event that's there. Okay. Uh, We meet twice a month, okay? Our next one is next Sunday. But we don't just have a lot of fun. We talk about really serious topics, too. Things that are going to challenge, yes, your faith, your thinking, how you see the world, how you look at it. Are you actually looking at the world and our current events that are constantly going on through a biblical lens? Are you looking at it through what God tells us, through His Spirit, through everything that He's given us? Are you channeling everything that you see through that right there? And so you guys have heard, heard us talk about the many different things. We've talked about Islam and other religions, and we're going to continue to do that. And we're going to talk about the hard topics constantly and help each other grow. It's by conversation and building relationships that we can help grow in our faith and knowing where each other are at. And it's not about always being right or wrong. It's, it's about growing. It's about being better as a community. And so if you're within that age group, I want you to join this group because it's a fun and awesome group. We meet twice a month. So that way I'm not taking up all of your time and schedule. More and more mine, okay? <laughs> um, but trust me, it's a great group. I want you guys to be able to join it, okay? And then for your tithes and offerings this morning, there are three ways for you to be able to give. You can give online at radiuschurch.life. You can also give using... Uh, the kiosk out there in the lobby, as well as the Dropbox on your way out as well. Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, that's right. I know, I know we've talked about this so much, okay, is today is our missions Sunday, okay, where we talked about it last week with our faith promises and everything that we are doing, and many of you guys promised to be able to start giving to missions for the first time, or some of you guys are rededicating, or you're upping your amount to be able to give, and so we have a video that we're going to share with you guys from one of our missionaries, and you can learn about what your giving has gone towards and how it has helped them grow, and I know we've talked about missions a lot, but missions is something that is very, very important and important to our own church, and you can see that by our own back wall that we have back there, so go ahead and roll it. Hey friends, this is Jamie Kemp, your missionary to Indonesia. Thanks so much for your faithful prayers and generous giving. It's making a huge impact. We believe that Indonesia will be the first Muslim-majority country to come to Christ. And one of the ways that's going to happen is by reaching the next generation. Reach the campus, change the nation. And you are helping to make that happen. Years ago, we had a a vision to move our ministry from reaching hundreds to reaching thousands. And with your help, we did it. Over the last four years, we've planted over 60 campus churches, reaching thousands of Muslim young people. And now, looking ahead, we have a vision to plant 40 more in the next two years. And our big vision is to have 250 campus churches by 2026. Because you gave, here's what's happening. Last month, over 220 pastors, campus missionaries, and church planters showed up from over 80 churches in Indonesia. There's never been a gathering like this in Indonesia to mobilize so many young leaders. And as a result of your giving, we are mobilizing thousands of young people from around the nation to be campus missionaries training hundreds of young leaders to start campus churches and empowering 10 pastors into full-time ministry. As you can see, your right now resources are having a forever impact.
Good morning, Radius Church. Here's your video announcements because we have some great stuff coming up for the whole family. Ladies, your Living Life to the Fullest event is coming up June 3rd. Get signed up right after service. Three great breakout sessions happening. They are not happening here at the church. They're happening at individuals' homes. So make sure you know where you need to be for the one that you sign up for. And then afterwards, you girls are getting lunch at Rockas, so don't miss out. Our Radius U, they're having a game night, May 20th at 6 o'clock right here at the church. It's going to be a great time of fun and fellowship. Don't miss out. Our kids Wednesday night recharge are having a movie and pizza night, May 24th. It is their last one of the year. Don't miss out because it's going to be mega amazing. Our destiny classes are starting up again in June on Wednesdays. Class starts at 6.45, but there's a free meal at 6 o'clock plus child care. So sign up right after service. If you're wondering what our destiny classes are for, it's if you want to learn more about God, learn more about our church, what we're doing, and how you can get involved in that. You can become a member here at Radius Church Then get signed up for this four-week class you don't want to miss out. That's all we have for you, Radius Church. Remember to check your bulletin, our website, and all of our social media accounts to stay up to date on the latest and greatest that's happening right here at Radius Church in case there's any cancellations or changes. So we hope and pray that you all have a wonderful and blessed day. Wasn't that video from Jamie and Tasha Kemp exciting? Amen. You know what's even more exciting is that they went to the mission field in 2009 And we were part of the group of people that took them on to send them there. When they went there about 14 years ago, none of that existed. But because of your faithful faith promise giving, they have reached thousands of students, hundreds of students. God is doing a big thing. That's the importance of our faithful faith promise giving. And I want to say thank you to all of you who made recommitments last Sunday And those of you who made new commitments, we had 12 brand new commitments to Missions Faith Promises, totaling $25,000 for Faith Promises. And I just want to say thank you for that. If you weren't with us and you would like to make a Faith Promise, I believe we have some cards in the Information Center. Or you can just give, um, when you give, just mark how much is going to Missions um, on your offering envelope, your check, or check those Missions boxes on the kiosk or online giving and that will get to missions and help us reach people all around the world. We tend to like big stuff. Star athletes, celebrities, huge crowds, grandiose events. Did anyone watch King Charles' coronation yesterday? A few of you did, yeah. You know, there's some people, they go all out, and they bought different kinds of food and that. Some people really enjoyed the Kentucky Derby. We have any Derby fans in here? Some people, yeah, a lot of people watch the Derby and stuff. I don't know, maybe some of you, when you did a watch party, you got those really wild hats and wild outfits. You know, some people do that, they do that. But these big, fancy events, big sporting events, do you realize that the Super Bowl 57, this year in 2023, had the largest USA viewing audience of any telecast in history. 115.1 million people watched the Super Bowl. We tend to gravitate towards these big events, big stars, big people. That's just our culture. The bigger, the better. And we can sometimes take that perspective into Christianity and into sharing our faith with other people. And we think instead of just me, ordinary old me sharing, it needs to be left up to the professionals. Let's get a big evangelism event with a celebrity preacher, a popular worship band, and a polished production, and that's how we're going to do evangelism. Let's leave it up to the pastors and the evangelists, the masters of divinity, the theologians, the apologists. Let's let the experts do evangelism because us ordinary people doing ordinary stuff We really can't accomplish much. But friends, what if that perspective needs to be challenged and reconsidered? What if the ordinary stuff really does matter? And I contend today it does. How many of you have ever watched kids playing t-ball? Huh? Some of you have. I know my kids. I watch my kids playing t-ball. And what happens in t-ball? Little Johnny gets up to bat at home plate, and on home plate there's this, you know, there's tea that stands up, and there's kind of a black rubber tea, there's a ball sitting on top, 
and he swings the bat with all his might, misses the ball, but hits the black tee, and as a result, the ball falls off and rolls about two, three feet in field. Now, if you know tee ball, that's a live ball. That is live. You can get out or you can get safe on that play right there. And so what does little Johnny do? His parents, everyone, the whole crowd's yelling, run, run, run. So you know what little Johnny does? He takes off running with all his might down the third baseline. <laughs> Not the first baseline. And as he's running with all his might, the hat is flipping around, and now he's peering out the eye hole. And his dad and his coach, they're saying, stop, stop, go over there, go to that one. You know, and everyone's going wild and nuts, no matter what happens. Why? Because little Johnny tried his best. What if we adopted that approach to evangelism, the approach to t-ball, where every attempt is cheered regardless of the results? Whether they cross the line of faith or whether they slap you in the face, I don't want to hear about that. What if we, like T-ball, we said, everybody plays? How many know that? In T-ball, it doesn't matter how good or how bad you are. Everybody plays. Everybody bats. No one sits on the bench. And friends, what I want you to realize is that in the kingdom, when it comes to evangelism, everybody plays. It's not just for the superstars. You have made the team. Jesus said in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. The God of the universe has hand-picked you and you and you and me to be on his team. And not the B team. We're first stringers. You're on the A team. Look, turn and look at your neighbor and say, you're on the A team. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, wait, no, okay. I've just lost some of you now for the next two, three minutes. But no, we're on the A-team. We're on the first string. All of us play in the game of helping all people to find and follow Jesus. All of us are great commission athletes that are trying to influence our radius around us. We all have a radius of influence, and God has called all of us. And here's the thing. Evangelism is not just... Yes, I say the prayer and I'm crossing the line of faith. Evangelism is every attempt you make to introduce Jesus or share his love or to serve or to be kind. Anything you do to try to bring people closer. Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water to someone in my name, you've done it to me. In the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some modern cups of cold water, some ordinary things that you and I can do, some ordinary things that Jesus modeled for us, and these things are called the nine arts of spiritual conversation. It's based off a book by the same name, and Pastor Don Ross referenced that a couple of weeks ago when he was here, and he had us fill out my mission cards. On those mission cards was the names of people that need to come to Christ, and he asked us, if you would come down front, you'd turn the card in and, and basically say, God, I'm volunteering for the next two years to pray and to try to engage these people on the card to bring them to Christ over the next two years. And we just return those cards to you this week. How many got your card in the mail? Okay, some of you have. Maybe some of it's coming slow. There's some of you we didn't have addresses for, so see us, we'll get it back to you. But I just want to encourage you, and hey, I want to say thank you to the 70 people that signed up 491 names saying these are people we're targeting, praying for, loving on, serving, wanting to bring them to know Jesus Christ. Can you give yourselves a hand for that? That is awesome. That is awesome. I want to say thank you for doing that and also thank you for being here. I invite you to join us these next few weeks as we look at the arts of of spiritual conversation because we not only want you to say, yeah, I want to reach those people on my mission card, but we want you to be equipped so you can effectively reach them. Also, I want to welcome our online audience. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I pray that you are engaged and you will join us on the journey and grow with us these next few weeks as we talk about how we can engage others and bring them to faith in Christ. 
So this morning, I want us to realize there are some right ways and wrong ways to approach evangelism, okay? There's right ways and wrong ways. If you're trying to get someone converted to Christ through arguments and debates, you may have already lost the battle. Because if you're fighting with someone, what you've done is you've built a wall and they become resistant. A lot of times when people have objections to Christianity, those objections are best answered after you've built a relationship. If you just come up to someone, you kind of overhear someone's objection, and you start trying to debate their theology or debate their logic, and you just engage in that, you don't see a huge result in that. Another thing that is wrong is when we view evangelism as a project. In college, I took an evangelism class, and we were required to go out with the street evangelism team three times in one semester. So every Friday night, they loaded up the vans, and we would hit the streets of downtown Aberdeen, South Dakota, and we would be on the streets, and as people are walking into bars, walking into restaurants, going into clubs, whatever they're doing, we would try to stop them and have some sort of spiritual conversation. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? If you died today, would you go to heaven or hell? You know, and we would try to engage in spiritual conversation, and that was our project. They're our project. We're seeking. Who can we talk to tonight? Why? Because i got to do it three times for the class. It's mandatory. How many want to know how well that turned out, huh? Not very well. Why? Because we're reviewing them as projects not as people that God loves. And so we need to make sure that we're taking the proper approach to evangelism and the arts of spiritual conversation are approaches Jesus used. And so we're going to look at the first two today, all right? If you're taking notes this morning, the first two we're going to look at is noticing those around us and praying for them. If you and I want the story of God to be heard by our family and our friends who don't know Christ yet, if we want people's lives to be impacted with what God has done for us, then we need to notice those around us and we need to pray for them. Noticing is something we take for granted. Sometimes we think because we saw something, we noticed it, but that is not the case. We can go through life so fast and so preoccupied that we truly don't notice people. And the more we learn how to notice people, the way Jesus did, you realize how Jesus noticed people? He noticed when he's on his way to a girl who is dying, he noticed when power flowed out of his body and healed someone. That's how in tune he was. Jesus noticed a cripple man by the pool of Bethesda, and he stopped and he prayed for him, and the guy was healed. Jesus was interrupted, and he noticed people and that's what we want to talk about this morning. Letter in your notes is Jesus made a habit, made noticing a habit. It was his habit, and it needs to become our habit. And I think a great example of this is found in Luke chapter 19. And the setting of this is that Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. He knows that very soon he's going to give his life. He's going to be crucified. And as he does, he goes to the city of Jericho, and there's hundreds of people that are thronging around him because they've heard about the miracles. They've heard about his teaching with authority. And so as he's walking through town, people are surrounding him. So we're going to pick up the story. That's the context in Luke chapter 19, verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. So he was a tax collector. Now, a lot of us, we don't like the IRS today, okay? We're not too fond of it. But friends, the IRS and being a tax collector back in those days, nowhere on the comparison of the spectrum of hate, okay? Think of how much you dislike the IRS. Magnify that by a thousand. And that's how people in Jesus' time felt about tax collectors. The reason is because, first of all, they were seen as being traitors. They collected taxes for the Roman Empire that was oppressing the entire region. Many nations, including the Jewish nation, were being oppressed by the Romans, and so you were seen as a traitor. But it was even worse than that. You were seen as being a thief because many times these tax collectors, 
they took more than the tax and they pocketed it. And we're going to see that come to place here in this, uh, in this story. In verse 3, Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. He's a short guy. He can't see over the crowd, so what does he do? He runs ahead of the crowd, climbs a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus since Jesus was coming that way. Now, you think of this. There's hundreds of people lining the road looking at Jesus. And Jesus, when he reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. Even though there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people, Jesus notices this little guy up on a tree, and Jesus invites himself over. What does the crowd do? Zacchaeus comes down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus didn't care about Zacchaeus' reputation. He cared about his soul, and because he cared about his soul, Jesus was willing to slow down, notice him, spend time with him, go to his house. And this is what happened. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. So in other words, anyone that I've overcharged taxes, I'm going to give him four times the amount. Don't you wish someone would do that for you? Wouldn't you wish the IRX gave you four times the taxes? I mean, that'd be awesome. But that's the heart change that took place in Zacchaeus' life just because Jesus noticed him. That's the power of noticing people because when you notice them, you value them. You say you're important. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And friends, the Gospels are full of stories of Jesus being interrupted, Jesus noticing someone, and Jesus reaching out to them in love. God is calling you and I to be noticers. And I want you to realize, Jesus, he's noticed you. Each and every one of you today. Those of you watching online, Jesus has noticed you. You haven't climbed a tree, but Jesus notices your situation. He knows what you're going through. He knows your financial problems. He knows those family issues, those relational issues, those situations at work. Jesus knows the health issues that you're experiencing. He knows your fears. He knows the things you haven't told anyone else. Jesus knows notices you. You have not gone in a blind spot to God. And He cares about you. He loves you. And I just want you to know that today. And so if you're struggling with something, you can know that Jesus notices you. In fact, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, Jesus notices you this morning, all right? Go ahead and say that. And that's if you're following Jesus or if you're not a follower of Jesus. Because God so loved the world, he gave his son for the whole world, not just a select few. Jesus notices you. All right, let's move on. Letter B, we need to develop a noticing habit. And we give you some suggestions on how to do that there, and I believe they're listed in your notes. One is just get up and walk around. Get up and walk around at the mall, at your office, at your store, during breaks, something like that, at work, just get up and walk around. Number two, take your earbuds out. If your earbuds are in, you cannot hear anything what's going around. In fact, you're kind of just in your own zone, doing your own thing, man. Take your earbuds out. Also, turn your cell phone off. Get off your cell phone. I mean, you don't need to be on it all the time. You don't need your phone on. Our phone keeps us from noticing people. It keeps us from connecting with people and engaging in relationship with them. Number four, listen to the conversations around you. Now, it's not like you're at the restaurant, like you go to a booth today and you sit down and you're stretching your ear back to hear. Okay, we're not talking like that. That's just kind of creepy. 
Don't do that, but just perk your ears up and see if you hear anything. Someone talking about, you know, my kid is sick or we're having financial problems. And when you hear it, you can begin praying for them. Just perk your ears up, see what conversations you hear. Number five, get involved in a group or a club in your community. And then number six, read the news. Read the news. And the point here is not to be a nosy person so you can get some great gossip to spread around because gossip is sin. The point is is that you actually notice people. You're paying attention to them, trying to be alert for the Holy Spirit to show you their needs, to show you what's going on in their life, and maybe how God wants you to interact with them. Our heart should break for people who don't know Jesus Christ. Our heart needs to be broken because you realize if they don't receive Christ, they, when they die, will go to hell and spend eternity in a place of suffering. Our hearts need to break for the lost. So we need to develop this noticing habit. And there was a guy in the Bible that God radically transformed. He was the Apostle Paul. And this is what happened when he was in a city and he just noticed what was going on around him. Acts chapter 17, verse 16, Paul is in Athens and while he's waiting for them, his missionary team in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Paul noticed the spiritual state of the city and saw multiple idols. We don't know how many, maybe hundreds of idols set up around the city to all these different gods. They even have an idol to the unknown God. I mean, these people, they wanted to cover all their bases. If there is a God that we don't know about, we got one to him so we can satisfy him. And when Paul saw the lostness, he was broken and he shared Christ and he led some people to Christ all because he noticed what was going on, the spiritual condition. And here's the thing I want us to realize is that there are spiritual gods around us. There are gods of success, of money and wealth, of sex, drugs, football. Yeah, football can be... There's a lot of things that can become a god. Leisure activities can become a god. And do we see the gods that different people are worshiping in their life and allowing God to give us a burden to distress us where we begin to pray for those people that God would set them free from those empty idols that don't give life. God wants us to begin to notice people, to notice their spiritual condition, to notice their needs, their hurts, so that you and I can begin to impact them. What do we need to do when we begin to notice these things? Let her see as we notice we must pray. Once we notice these things in people's lives, we need to pray for them. And Jesus encouraged the disciples to do this. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest. Friends, the world around us is hurting, just as like it was hurting in Jesus' time. And Jesus doesn't want you and I to hunker down in our Sunday morning gatherings and say, Wow, that was a great service today. He wants us to say that, but he wants us to go out and to notice people and to pray for them and to engage in them. And we're going to be teaching you how to do that over the next few weeks with these arts of spiritual conversation. Don't say, I'm just ordinary, because it's that t-ball where the ordinary thing where people learn how to play the game. It's the ordinary things of life where people learn Jesus is the life. Life is not a game. He is about life, and those ordinary things that you and I can do can change their lives. I love this prayer Jesus prayed because do you realize he was praying for you and me? He prayed for laborers for the harvest 2,000 years after he prayed this prayer. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're an answer to that prayer. Is that cool or what? You and I are an answer to a 2,000-year-old prayer. And Jesus wants you to reach the lost 
hurting, harassed, helpless people that are around you. They're like sheep without a shepherd, and God wants you to introduce them to the good shepherd who loved them and gave his life and laid it down for them so that they could live. Let's look at the last thing we need to do here. We must continually pray. As we're noticing what's going around us, we just don't see it. We say, oh God, help them right here, and then we go on and forget it. No, we need to continually pray for the people that we notice. The Apostle Paul, he taught the, uh, the Ephesians that truth. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, he says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Why do we need to be alert? Because we're in a battle. If you rewind a few verses earlier, he says we don't wrestle against principalities and or we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. There is a spiritual battle that's going on for the lives of people. The devil doesn't want a single soul to go to heaven. He wants as many people to not encounter God's love as possible. And so as we're talking about sharing the love and the grace of God, about noticing people, we need to make prayer a major weapon. We need to be alert to notice what's going on because it is a spiritual battle that we fight and spiritual battles can only be won with spiritual tactics and prayer is one of your greatest weapons that you have. So we need to pray continually and not formulaic prayers, but prayers that are led by the Spirit. As Paul said, you need to pray in the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit help you notice things in people's lives, the situations going on. And as you notice them, then you just pray conversationally to God that God would help them. Do you pray for your neighbors? Do you pray for your coworkers? Do you pray for your children when they go to school? Do you pray for their teachers? God wants us to pray. Two things happen when we pray, all right? We move the heart of God, and then also our hearts change towards others. Do you pray for your children's classmates? Do you pray for your children's classmates' parents, their friends' parents? Do you pray for your barista? Do you pray for your boss or your co-workers? God wants us to be a praying people that we pray for people. Your prayer can be something as simple as, Jesus, help me to hear you today. Jesus, open my ears to hear other people today. Jesus, I want to glorify you today. Or Jesus, bless my boss today. They don't have to be difficult prayers. They can be simple prayers. Your prayers might go on for years and years and years without seeing any fruit. When my wife and I, when we lived in Iowa, we pastored in Iowa for 14 years. And in the neighborhood we moved into, we began to pray for our neighbors. I prayed for several of them almost every day and over the course of 14 years we saw two families come to Christ there was a lot of other families that didn't come to Christ but we did that and I did I did snow blowing evangelism okay when it was uh, when there was snow on the ground I would go and I'd blow them out you know depending on time and that kind of thing did snow blowing evangelism reached out to them when I saw them I waved I said hi to them how many times are you outside you see your neighbor and you do nothing you don't notice they're there because you're so engrossed mowing your lawn. Isn't it great to mow your lawn now instead of shovel snow? But you're so engrossed in mowing your lawn because you got your earbuds in and you don't hear anything and you don't notice anyone. Or you're out painting or redoing some weather stripping that got bad for winter and we don't notice our neighbors. We've been in our neighborhood now for 14 years and I haven't seen a single neighbor come to Christ. But you know what? I'm still praying for my neighbors to know Jesus. Because God loves them and he gave his life for them. And there are times we pray prayers and we see no fruit or little fruit. But don't give up because in due season we will reap a harvest. So keep praying and maybe you have a family member 
who's like my neighbors. I pray, but I see no results. Maybe you have a boss or a coworker or a classmate that you've been praying for and you just see no results. Keep on praying. Don't quit praying. We need to be a people who pray. Do you pray for your kids' as friends' parents? Do you pray for your parents? Are you praying for your neighbors? Are you praying for your children and their spouses? That they have godly spouses, that they would raise godly kids. We need to be praying for people. I want you to look at the bottom of your message notes. And we've got four ways, four next steps for you to apply this message, to respond to it. Number one is a prayer walk. Take some time this week. Just walk through your neighborhood. Notice the houses. Notice the people that are there. Maybe see if you can hear what's going on, any conversations. If you see any situations, just say, Holy Spirit, quicken my mind, quicken my understanding of how I need to pray for my neighbors. Just take a prayer walk. Maybe take your kids with you on the prayer walk and see what you can notice together. Number two, commit to praying for at least three people this week, one minute each. Many of you, you've got your My Mission card back. I want you to take at least three of those people and pray one minute. Maybe set an alarm on your phone for one o'clock and when one o'clock goes off or maybe you want to set a little bit before, right? If you're on your lunch hour, take three minutes before you end your lunch hour and pray one minute each for those people. Maybe some of you say, man, I'm too busy. I don't notice my alarm. I'm too busy in my day. Well then, when will you notice it? Maybe before you eat at dinner tonight, before you eat pray for those three people. Or maybe in your own devotions, take a minute and pray for those people. You say, what do I pray for? Let the Holy Spirit show you what to notice and what to pray for. He'll show you. Number three, memorize Ephesians 6.18. It's hard for us to remember the principles of God and the promises of God but it's a whole lot easier when we've memorized Scripture. So memorize Ephesians 6.18. You say, wait a second, I thought that was for kids. It is for kids. But it's also for adults. We need it as adults, too. And this is an area I need to grow in. My, my wife and I and our daughter, we're working on John chapter 15. We've been working on John chapter 15 a long time. We want to get it done before she goes off to college. But that's something we're trying to memorize and I, we're going to give you scriptures every week to memorize. I encourage you to pick up scripture memorization and make it a new habit as part of your spiritual growth and development. And then there is one last step, and that's receive Jesus as your forgiver and your leader. And I know we talked about this a while back during communion, but maybe there are some of you today that you just kind of ignored that little spiel and maybe you've been expected it coming maybe you've been here a few times and you know that we always give people an opportunity to respond to entering a relationship with jesus and it's like whoo made it past that one well you know what there's a double whammy there's a second opportunity today and i like everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes because maybe you're here and God has been knocking on the door of your heart or maybe you're watching us online and you know God's been speaking to you but you have said, no, God, I'll do it later. I've got time. Friends, you don't know how much time you have. You don't know you could leave here today and get in a car accident or have a heart attack. Something could happen this week and you might not be back next Sunday. You can't say, I've got time because nobody knows how much time they have. And I'm not trying to pressure you or anything, but I want you to know God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He loves you so much he gave Jesus his son to die on the cross for your sin. And if you ask God to forgive you and to become the leader of your life, he'll give you a relationship and you'll start a spiritual journey with him. And with no one looking around, every head bow, every eye close, is there anyone here who would say, Craig, I'm going to stop holding out. I'm not going to wait for a later time. I realize this is my time. This is my moment. And you'd raise your hand saying, I want to receive Christ. I need a relationship with him. I, I surrender my life to him. 
Anyone here in the house? Thank you. I see those in the middle. Anyone else today? Anyone else this morning? You'd say, I want a relationship with Jesus. Just put your hand up and you put it back down. If you're watching online and that's you, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm going to say this prayer. It's a very simple prayer. You heard one very similar a few moments ago. Let's pray together, everyone praying this. Father God, thank you for loving me so much that you gave Jesus to die for my sin. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I surrender my life. I want to follow you. I want to love you, please you, and serve you. Help me to bring other people into a relationship with you. Amen.